T tests for proportions, and we're going to go over an example together. So let's get started. Alright, so t-tests work a lot, for proportions at least, work a lot like t-tests for averages. So we've already learned about the t-test, and if you haven't seen that video already, make sure you check that video out. I'm going to pull up a sketch pad and we're going to take a look at an example of a t-test and talk about like what it is. So let me pull this up. There we go. Alright, so let's say, again, we had that Apple claim, remember? Apple claimed that... 80% are male. 80% of its users are male. Now, I gathered a sample of a thousand people, and I found that literally exactly half of them, so 50%, were male. Now, a t test is a way of, of showing that that value is statistically significant. Basically, you're saying, yes, this sample shows that the previous hypothesis is false, that the uh, that it's not true that 80% of the population is male. So we're trying to prove that this theory is wrong. We're trying to show that's not true. Now, to do that, we would need to develop a confidence interval. Now, in the last class, in the last lecture, we talked about how to develop confidence intervals for, um, for proportions. So let's say we do that. And again, if you want to understand the math of developing that, take a look at that last, um, that last lecture. We talked about how the formula was P hat plus or minus T star times the standard deviation, which had a different formula divided by the square root of N. And let's say we do that and we get a, um, let's use blue here. We get a confidence interval of, let's say, point, uh, let's do point 0.3 and point 0.7. Now, first off, you should notice that what's the number in between those two numbers? That number is 0.5 or 50%, and that's not by accident. The middle of the confidence interval should always be the, the statistic that you gathered or this number. This number is literally your um, the middle of your confidence interval, and this number represents your margin of error. So if this was my confidence interval, then I can say that, and let's say I'm 95% certain, which is typically the percentage of accuracy that you would need in, in the scientific community to be convincing enough. So now you can go up to the scientific community and say, I am 95% confident that the actual proportion of Apple users that are male are between 30% and 70%. Now let me ask you something, is 80% in that region right there? No, it's not. Meaning that this confidence interval has shown that I'm 95% certain that that claim is literally false. I am at least 95% certain that that claim is false. Therefore, according to the scientific community, you should believe me that Apple is wrong about this. And if Apple is wrong, then we should take the next best option, which is 50%. Until at least someone else comes by and says, eh, 50% is also a little bit off. But for now, I am 95% confident that it's not 80%, it's 50%. And that's basically how science works. Now let's talk about what happens if your test fails. Let's suppose with a 95%, you develop a 95% confidence interval and you get this, 0.6, or let's do, not 0.6, let's do 0 0.2 and no, 0.1 and 0.9. Now, if this is the confidence interval and this was a 95% confidence interval, then essentially, this says nothing. You're not saying that I'm 95% confident that Apple is right because it still could be, it could very well be that Apple is still wrong. Basically, what you're saying is my hypothesis failed, my test failed, and if your tests fail, then you cannot develop a conclusion. And this is something that a lot of students uh, oftentimes mistake. 
they think that if their test fails, then you have proven the opposite of your claim. That's not how science works. The way science works is you, you, you conduct a test, and if your test works, then you show something with 95, at least 95% accuracy, typically. But if your test fails, then essentially every part of your test is complete, uh, to be honest, it's garbage, it's completely uh, ir irrelevant and pointless because it failed, and therefore you can't develop any conclusions from that. You should never could develop a conclusion from a failed test. This is a failed test, and therefore I cannot make any conclusion about this claim. I can't say it's correct, I can't say it's not correct, because I can't develop a conclusion doing so off of a faulty test, off of a failed test, would be kind of a bad idea. So um, this is how a confidence interval for a t-test works. And this is uh, an example of one as well. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you in the next video.